Hello, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll hold it. So recording will sound like shit. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you for being here. Yeah, my name is Paolo. So I've been doing games for about 10 years, a little bit more than 10 years under the project name of Industria, which is a project about uh, ideology and entertainment. Uh, the idea is to make uh, uh, small, politically engaged, socially engaged games, uh, um, and also make games that are in some way a um, remedy, um, an antidote to mainstream entertainment in general. So um, you might have seen some of these. Uh, they are pretty obscure and uh, becoming more and more obscure for the reasons that Lana was talking about. <laughs> uh, all right, anyway, I'm gonna start uh, uh, pretty heavy. So this is a quote from Roland Barthes that uh, back in the 60s, uh, this French critic was uh, lamenting how uh, cultural criticism was so centered on the cult uh, of uh, the author, or the author actually was about the same time uh, um, uh, Truffaut was making his movies. And uh, his claim was that um, that uh, the obsession with the au uh, author. So if you're if you're not reading, is it, like you know saying that ba Baudelaire's work is the failure of the man Baudelaire. Van Gogh, uh, Van Gogh's work is uh, is his madness. Uh, like this uh, this reduced the possible interpretation of a, of an artwork. Essentially, the critic is in charge of explaining us what the message is uh, and. Uh, uh, Barthes want, wanted basically to reclaim the reader as a protagonist, to as somebody who can basically freely uh, read and misread a text, and it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a wishful thinking, a, a bit of a um, provocation. But he celebrated basically practices that rejected some of this uh, authorial control, like the surreal, surrealist uh, automatic writing or techniques or the use of, of chance. Uh, ironically, if you look up uh, this essay uh, that I just quoted, Google will present you with this result. Uh, uh, Roland Barthes, uh, uh, the death of the author, uh, the cause of that is traffic collision. And it, it's true, uh, he di actually died uh, in a car accident, but it shouldn't be probably the first thing that shows up. Uh, who cares about that, really? Uh, so like, we can think about this as a glitch like the algorithm is making uh, some semantic mistake, but you know, algorithms, algorithms have uh, authors as well. You know, like I know a person who works at Google Pits, uh, Pittsburgh who basically uh, takes care of this kind of problem, that does like manual disambiguation for important search on Google Shopping. Like his authorship is kind of hidden, but is not considered relevant, but still like he's, uh, he has a hand into that. And uh, this was for some time was also the case for video games as well. Uh, video games come from a kind of engineering background, and they have a, a, this history of authorship. Uh, uh, you know, early games were, were seen as uh, coin-operated appliances, as electronic toys. Uh, in, the, in the Atari age, in the Atari era, uh, the creators, like names were never, were never showing up on the, on the cover, and uh, not even in the game. In the case of Adventure, this is the first top-down uh, dungeon crawler. is basically the beginning of a lot of genres that today we still have. Uh, the designer had to hide his name in a very secret area of, uh, of, of the game. Uh, it says, like, created by um, Warren, uh, whatever, uh, Robinette, yes. Um, and this was the first uh, Easter egg uh, in, ever appeared in a video game. And uh, by the way, the screen occupied about 5% of the whole storage space of that game. So it was pretty major. And uh, he said, uh, he said something interesting. He said like, okay, my boss uh, has the power to prevent my name from appearing on the box, but I have the power to put it on the screen somehow. So, and I like to think of, uh, of this episode as the first uh, salvo in the endless conflict uh, between uh, suits and uh, game creators, be between publisher, producer, and game creator creators. Obviously, Things change now, and uh, today we recognize and celebrate uh, both obscure game uh, pioneers and uh, both the uh, like indie creators that are uh, indie creators are almost compelled to present themselves as authors uh, to build a personal brand to tie these stories uh, and uh, identities in the game or within the game. We are seeing uh, even more and more personal games in which the authors. Uh, voices and biographies are literally incorporated in their work. Uh, but I think we shouldn't mistake this type of overtly personal work as the only and uh, most uh, authorial type of work. 
uh, I'm more personally, I'm more interested in games that are less personal, that appear less personal, because they are the ones that uh, risk to be taken as uh, morally and politically neutral. They are the ones that uh, reflect, uh, they're the ones that reflect the common sense, the dominant ideology. And uh, um, also because the historical lack of uh, personal voice in games uh, is also connected with the denial of meaning and responsibility in games. Uh, like historically we've been saying, oh, a game doesn't mean much because there's nobody really speaking. It's just like a, a, a tech product, a simulation and so on. So today I want to talk about SimCity and uh, there are some reasons. It's, it's the first game that kind of forced people to take the issue of, of ideology or basically politicize uh, uh, in, um, of politics, essentially, and bias in uh, in games seriously. Uh, I'm also making a series of city games that are meant to be a counterpoint to SimCity. I'm going to just briefly introduce. Um, all right, so uh, now I'm not really going to focus too much on Will Wright himself. I mean, he's right. Uh, he hasn't worked in SimCity games for a long time, but I believe some of his assumptions that are informing not only the current sim cities, but a lot of other games uh, have never been questioned. It was, he's so influential, these games are so influential that be, just became a part of the genre. And uh, yeah, continue, continue to have this kind of influence. So now SimCity is a series of games that has been going on for more than 25 years. Uh, and uh, there are some significant differences between uh, the various editions. But I'm mostly talking about the common features. So I'm kind of using SimCity interchangeably. If you are a SimCity nerd, uh, you might you might be very disturbed by that. But, but yeah, I'm kind of like treating this as a body of work, as a con some somewhat consistent body of work. All right, some of you might know that since it started as a lever editor for a top-down shooter, and uh, Will Wright realized that he was, uh, he was working on this like shooting game, and uh, he realized that he was enjoying creating cities more than you know, destroying them. And uh, the original SimCity was released in uh, 1989. Uh, after several years, it was created, actually. It was very innovative because it was a sandbox. It was like a software toys. There was no winning and losing condition. At the time, it was uh, pretty uh, bold. In fact, uh, it didn't find a publisher for several years because of that. So this is SimCity to 2000, the version from uh, 193, which, which introduced the isometric view that still, I think, we associate most with Sin City. So if you never played any Sin City, you have to know that the gameplay is not about just dropping buildings and uh, like in a Lego set. You basically lay down in infrastructures and, uh, and uh, streets, but for everything else, uh, you can only designate certain area for certain use. So you, you're basically zoning, zoning to residential use, uh, to commercial use, industrial, and so on. After you zone these areas, the building, buildings might or might not develop. People might or might not move in and uh, prosper. So it's, it's a lot about observing and trying to understand the underlying dynamics. It, uh, it is uh, an emergent system in which uh, a limited number of um, uh, mo simple modules create a great deal of complexity. The designer uh, will write, uh, often compare it to gardening. You have a limited control over a living organism. You're basically like, you know, like pruning and touching and seeding and then see what happens and then you come back the day after and uh, you do a, a little other tweak. Oh my God, this, this, this music is terrible. <laughs> All right. <laughs> However, that is not a game about gardening. It's a, be, it's a game, pretty much a game about cities. Uh, over and over, Sin City, the Sin City series invoked uh, realism as a selling point. This is the box of that game uh, in the back. It's, it playfully warns uh, uh, if this game was uh, uh, if this game were any more realistic, it would be illegal to turn it off. It's like, uh, realism is like a big selling point. And uh, today, still, still today, it's being used and has been used as an educational tool. It's kind of shaping the way a lot of people understand or misunderstand urban city planning. So this is a recent initiative, uh, a modified educational version for profit. Um, the original Sin City now now is open source and ships with the one laptop per child. It's a mostly failed uh, educational project that uh, consisted in sending a cheap laptop in uh, developing countries. But you know, like even if the project is, is fail, like uh, I, I've always been intrigued by this thing that we are shipping our ideas of North American cities to the third world. 
Um, and because of this educational uses and because of this claim of realism, the fact that this is not just a game, but also a game that is uh, about something real, Sin City has been criticized uh, pretty much from every angle. I'm gonna give you just like br a brief overview, overview. For starters, Sin City's, uh, uh, kind of promises uh, endless possibilities. That's the idea of sandbox. You kind of like, you, you get to build the city of your dreams. But the reality is that you always end up with a very specific kind of city that looks pretty much like Phoenix, Arizona, or certain like uh, desert uh, American modernist cities. So the only type of city you can create is the modernist uh, car-centered uh, North American grid-based cities. Um, although it's true that in some recent version they tried to allow for non-grid based plans and more like European style, still I don't think you can build Antwerp. Um, and it's not just a matter of appearances of how the thing looks. Uh, the underlying model is normative too. Um, once I try to build the city of my dreams, like, uh, you know, let's, let's do this. And uh, it was based on uh, the uh, situationist principle of urban uh, unitarism. I'm not gonna go too much into situationism, but basically they were saying, um, they, 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 they thought the modern city planning was the organization of alienation. They criticized the dominance of cars uh, and the separation of workspaces uh, and uh, leisure spaces. And by the way, these are not like radical ideas anymore. These are uh, wrapped together with the concept of livable and creative cities. Uh, so they have been absorbed by the mainstream discourse around urbanism. But yeah, I wanted to make a, a, a game about, about that, like an eco-friendly, sustainable type of city. So I mixed workplaces and recreation places. I used a lot of one-way streets to reduce traffic, which is, is none of them. I heavily invested in public transportation. Basically, I wanted to make a European city. Um, and um, I also like uh, added a lot of uh, high-density zones, but green zones. and. Uh, I guess what, uh, this, the virtual citizens uh, hated it. Uh, it was not a thriving city. Like, they were like really mad at me. Um, high density zones uh, almost turned immediately into project, like very like, um, you know, uh, poor people type of settlements and uh, industries uh, look like, look like uh, super old crap anyway. So I got annoyed at my citizens that were so, uh, so, so mad at my beautiful city and I created a dystopian city. I, I created this city called Purgatoria that is built on a hill like uh, Dante's Purgatory and it's heavily stratified, you know, it's like a over-identify with a class-based system that seems, seems to be at the, uh, at the basis. So on the top of your head, basically all the fancy stuff, you have the rich people, the services, the museums, uh, and uh, going down you have the upper middle class, the commercial zone, and then at the very end, the wor working class and the slums at the very bottom with all the dirty industries. Uh, there's always like a cloud, cloud of smoke and uh, pollution there. No services. So the use of space was not the most efficient, I have to admit. But I was surprised to see that the city worked better than the situation is one I was talking about. The, the virtual citizens were uh, not too dissatisfied. They were like, eh, that's, that's all right. Yeah. So this is a quote by the lead designer of the most recent Sin City, which came, uh, came out in 2013, so it's pretty recent. So he's explaining the design choices they had to take when uh, modeling crime, when creating uh, the re internal relationship that produced crime, which is always uh, you know, a very, very contentious issue. Uh, I think it's illuminating. It's, it's basically saying, for those of you who can read, uh, something we will not want to bind uh, is crime to social class, because that's outside of the player's control seems of different wealth move into the city. So ignoring the sociological statement we are making with that, but just uh, looking at it uh, as a game mechanic, that would be a sucky thing to do because what can the player do about it? Um, so like you see, it's illuminating because we can see that they, they, are, they understand they are making statements, they are making sociological statements about what causes crime, but they cannot possibly conceive social mobility or redistribution of wealth. For them, for, for this lead designer, class stratification is uh, basically a constant beyond the player's uh, agency. As if uh, cities did not have uh, a role in the exacerbation or improvement of social inequality. Uh, so race and, very connected, race and, ra and class conflicts are also sanitized. You'll never see racial riots in SimCity. Uh, these conflicts <clears throat> uh, 
for you, like uh, the song is rare. This, 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 by the way, is our uh, like artworks made by um, an American artist called John Ad Haddock. So these conflicts were crucial for uh, the development of North American cities. Uh, racially motivated riots scare white, m white middle class families who left in their cities to move to safer sub suburbs. You've seen those things in uh, movies, so in American movies. So in uh, the United States, this is referred as the, the white flight. It created a vicious cycle of segregation. Basically, wealthy people move, move, move and uh, move their tax monies and jobs uh, out in the suburbs uh, while poverty and crime concentrates in the city centers. Now we are seeing the inverse, uh, the opposite trend. Uh, and uh, in Europe, you can see like the, the thing is a little bit flipped. Usually the banlieue, the slums are uh, in, the out, in, in the outskirts, but yeah. Uh, but anyway, you will not see this crucial dynamic in the Sin City model, even if it's a very North American type of model. Now. There is no uh, video camera for simulations. There is no machine that can uh, uh, capture, mechanically capture behaviors in real life and uh, spit out simulations. Uh, there is no like recorder for simulation, you know? The process of modelization of going from uh, a piece of world uh, to a uh, simulated piece of world is empirical, is intuitive, is arbitrary. A simulation is basically a theory about the functioning of a certain thing. And this certain thing can be a city, a human in love, a collision of a rigid body. Uh, in uh, the case of scientific simulation, we use the term simulation also for scientific simulation, like the models we use to predict climate change uh, that are super important, that are really shaping policies right now. Uh, this kind of simulation are typically tested against uh, you know, actual data. They are iterated and tested like that. Uh, when we talk about simulation games, we don't really do that. Like we, do, we should have, a, I think, we should have a completely different word for simulation game, and just to avoid this confusion. So the same, the same part of SimCity comes from the field of system dynamics, which is, um, uh, as we'll write, admit, as the major inspiration for the game. System dynamics was um, a field established by uh, J. Uh, J. Wright Forrester in the 50s. This is an example of system dynamics. You know, feedback loops, something that most, most of you are probably familiar with in some intuitive way. So basically, uh, Forrester postulated that we make decisions through mental models. So, uh, which are not accurate depiction of reality, but are rather are a set, uh, sets of assumptions based uh, on uh, our experience. Uh, and computer simulation are just mathematical, computational formalization of these mental models. But still, they are useful because we can run them. They are more in important and more interesting. It's a step beyond just uh, you step beyond using simple ment mental models because we can run them, we can uh, you know, contract expand times, we can uh, uh, fiddle with the inputs and outputs. Uh, and the reason why we want to do that is to try to discover nonlinear, complex, counterintuitive trends and, uh, and uh, behaviors. So, so in this case, just this, this is like a classic example of adoption of new products. And you see like the adoption is not a linear thing, has curves, and what creates these curves is just a set of feedback uh, loops uh, going on at the same time. And that's pretty much what happens in SimCity as well. But Jay Forrester uh, saw design, the design of simulation as an iterative pro process. Simulations are tools that you are constantly testing and tweaking. You're just kind of like creating a simulation and then seeing what it spits out. And uh, their results uh, uh, are supposed to challenge your uh, own assumption or can potentially challenge your own assum assumption. Oh, I didn't know that this model of uh, overfishing in, uh, in, uh, in Canada actually produced this, uh, this, uh, this result that is not linear and so on. Uh, but that's also not what happens when you play a video game. As a player, you can change the inputs, but not the internal relationship of a system. Unless you have access to source code, unless you are a, you have a, you are a pretty deep modder, like in uh, City Skylines and so on. So what you really do uh, is trying to basically reverse engineer in this modelization process, uh, by, mostly by trial and error. You're basically trying to deduce uh, the designer's assumption based uh, starting from your own assumption. So I think that's the, re the reason why the designers cannot really afford to be too imaginative, too counterintuitive, because uh, uh, it's just easier and safer to align with the most common assumptions. So you, if you add industries, you create jobs. If you add police stations, you reduce crime. And uh, 
consider that when players' assumptions don't match the designer's assumptions, the, uh, the game might actually appear broken. They might appear like a glitch, like I don't understand why this is happening because it doesn't just work with my mental model. And, and if that br this breaking of expectation is not really explained and framed uh, as a statement, uh, people will, will freak out. And that actually happens. When the most recent Sin City came out, many players were disturbed by homeless people. They were, like, they were, they were full of homeless people, they were hanging out in their cities, and uh, they didn't know how to solve that problem. Mostly because we probably we don't really know how to solve the problem of homelessness in the United States, really. So they thought it, it was basically a bug. They, they thought, oh my god, this game is broken. And uh, there is an artist, a uh, friend of mine, Matteo Bittanti, uh, who's a game critic as well, and started to collect all these theories and conversations among players that were happening online about homelessness in Sin City. Uh, they he just like uh, copy paste uh, a, in, an infinite amount of them and publish them in a book that is like 600 pages long. It's a work of conceptual literature, and it's about the unexpected, quote, the unexpected convergence and collapse between reality and simulation. And uh, yeah, some of the quotes are like, oh, I, I have about 100 homeless, my population is about blah, blah, blah. Uh, so not exactly a homeless epidemic, but sh I just can't can seem to get them into homes uh, and so on. Um, I would be more than happy to build a homeless shelter if the game had the option. So that's the kind of conversation he, he's collecting. Or other are like, uh, oh, get, get more police to shoot them down. Uh, and uh, once you have homeless, they hang out panhandling and eating garbage. Make sure that your garbage collection is operating uh, adequately and they will either disappear, die, or wander off from the highway. So, you see, like, uh, uh, decontextualize, this, these are like really, uh, I mean, obviously reveal uh, racist and classist biases, but they are also turning into highly political debates. So, like, uh, uh, it's, and, and I, I like the fact that this is the kind of pol politicization that Sim City designers always try to avoid. Oh, we are not really making any statement, but guess what? You are. Um, yeah, like, keep those in the ghettos and so on. So the other big inspiration for Will Wright for Sin City was uh, this short story by uh, this Polish science fiction writer called Stanislaw Lem. Uh, it's called The Seven Sally, or The Seven Sally, or Hor How Trolls' uh, Own Perfection Led to No Good. It's part of an epic called uh, Cyberiad, uh, pretty uh, unknown, but very popular among text circles, actually. And um, uh, the epic is about pretty much about technology, really, and the limits of consciousness and artificial intelligence. And uh, um, it's about the adventures of these two supernatural engineers. They are like gods, uh, but also roboticists and uh, programmers. They are creators of worlds. worlds. And uh, one of them is called Pearl, which is the protagonist of this, uh, of this short story that you can find online. Uh, the story goes like this. So, like, Troll is traveling in space and uh, finds a man uh, living alone on an asteroid. It's just like this guy on an asteroid. And uh, it, we find that the man is uh, a king. He used to be a king that has been overthrown and uh, exiled by his own uh, subjects, so citizens. So the despot, basically this, the king, asked Thrall to uh, make him a king again, to reinstate him as a, as a ruler. And uh, um, this troll guy, who is a bit of a hacker, a bit of a life hacker, finds a better way to fix this problem, finds a technological solution, which consists in creating a hyper-realistic simulation of a kingdom that fits in a box. So this uh, despot, this uh, uh, tyrant, can just like fiddle and play with this fake citizen, this fake society, and abuse them without hurting anybody. And uh, the, I mean, that's, that's the description uh, that is... Uh, Kind of interesting, uh, basically explaining uh, to yeah. How, it, this is the scene in which uh, that troll explains this king how to manipulate and to and to play this game, that which really appears as a it retroactively appears like an interactive simulation that can manipulate it like a game. Um, the story, by the way, is a satire of totalitarianism because at the end uh, we find out that the king has been overthrown and killed by its own virtual citizens in the box. They broke out of the box uh, and uh, colonized the entire asteroid. So it's uh, um, also a meditation of how uh, simulations and artificial intelligence can actually become uh, pretty much uh, real. Um, so, like the civilization in the box in the story, since it is not just about planning, but you have to take also policy decisions. Uh, for example, you have to uh, decide how to tax your citizens. 
And uh, in all the games of the series, your tax rate is around 12%. If your tax rate is around 12% higher, uh, citizens get really upset. So with 20% of taxes, typically your wealthy citizens will simply live regardless of the service you provide. Uh, apparently, some uh, it is has been reported. This is a screen from some player that managed somehow managed, managed to run cities with zero taxes, like no taxation, and they still can, you know, make the, the game work. And this is a pretty a pretty clear libertarian type of bias in many countries like this one, uh, people tolerate high taxation if they feel like they get some valuable services, right? However, uh, some, of liber uh, some libertarian commentators saw these superpowers, this ability that you know, you're both the planner, the mayor, the budget person, uh, uh, and the government really, uh, they saw this as a, almost like a socialist propaganda. Uh, SimCity is teaching our children that cities uh, need to be planned and managed uh, centrally by a central authority, which is the player, instead of letting, letting the free market decide. And, uh, you know, I personally don't find the totalitarian aspect too problematic, to be honest. Uh, I think uh, in order to describe a city as a dynamic entity, or any really system as a dynamic entity, something that you, you can and should be able to change, uh, you sort of need an exaggerated agency. So I'm, I'm kind of fine with that. But... Um, the problem, the problem is something a little bit different. So this is what a real city management software uh, uh, looks like. So it's basically a long <laughs> spreadsheet of things to do, uh, th things to fix. So that's, that's how a, re a truly realistic city game will, will be like, uh, about uh, upkeeping, maintaining, fixing, fixing potholes and streets. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't have too much to say about any city. But uh, the problem with these superpowers is that they take out of the equation other kinds of powers uh, that are shaping our urban environments. Uh, uh, cities are always the result of conflicts, conflicts between uh, classes, groups, public and private interests. And in particular, real estate developers and speculators today have a major role in the evolution of cities. Uh, and that's something you don't really see in Sin City. Um, the, issue, the issue of control extends uh, to the natural environment as well, like the superpower sort of spill over to the natural environment as well. So this is a, a typical starting point for a SimCity in uh, any really episode. Like nature is like a blank slate uh, ready to be taken over. It's inhabited and uh, pre-commodified already. You have uh, your lot of land and nothing is there. No Indians, no forests. So sometimes there are actually forests. Um, so it's very common in uh, games to have a territory that comes already partitioned in a unit of lands, right? This is a civilization which also uses a grid system. And of course, there are, you all know that there are very solid technical reasons why you want to use grids in games. Uh, but still, when applied to the natural environment, they suggest a very rationalized and commodified view of the natural environment. So uh, SimCity is considered a sandbox. Uh, it doesn't have explicit goal, but it has all sort of feedback, uh, qualitative feedback that point to some implicit goals, which are uh, growth, which is usually related to happiness and wealth. So you can play in many different ways. You can destroy things. Uh, you can uh, trigger disaster. But the most rewarding way and the most, uh, I think, deep way to play the game is really to tra try to make a big functional city. Uh, so SimCity does encourage, uh, implicitly encourage endless growth without even, without ever really confronting the player with the scarcity of resource. You can sort of expand and then until you reach the limits of the uh, scenario. And uh, in Sin City 2000, when the map is full, you can even build our colleges, with, which are cities within cities. So you can keep expanding and, and building more. And when you fill the map with our colleges, and some people actually manage to do that, um, they simply take off. They become like spaceships and, uh, and uh, start colonizing another space and you start over. So it is essentially perpetually delaying the question, are there any limits to growth? So this is a, a documentation of Magna Santi, which is a sim city created by a guy called... Uh, oh, actually, the sound is not that interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, by Vincent Ocasla, is, uh, is an architecture student. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's basically, uh, he, th this guy wanted to beat the game by creating the most populated Sin City ever. Just gonna play a second, so I take a...
you're seeing here is basically his uh, uh, blueprints and his uh, post-mortem, I guess. What he basically did, basically did was um, um, analyzing the game's algorithm, optimizing the distances between resources, transportation and infrastructure, and uh, uh, basically figuring out a modular structure to uh, uh, that ensure maximum efficiency and maxim maximum growth. Uh, so he claimed that this was a commentary on uh, totalitarianism uh, uh, because this looks pretty much like a totalitarian, uh, dystopic kind of city. It's not a city you want to live in. Or a city built by robots, you know, like the Matrix uh, robots. And uh, to me, it's interesting for other reasons, uh, actually. Uh, not, not just for the commentary that kind of makes, but also because it surfaces the computational nature of the simulation. It presents SimCity uh, for what it is, really, uh, kind of like a set of cellular automata. And uh, I think this uh, this is this might be the most like this is like a bunch of uh, graphs and uh, and formulas that this guy came up with to to reverse engineering the the, the algorithm. And I think this. Uh, this computational nature might be the most fundamental bias of the series that is shared by all video games. Uh, since it is a mathematical simulation, so everything is reduced to quantity and to numbers, variables, equations. And uh, that's something we have to sort of deal with whenever we make games about, you know, that involve uh, something more than, uh, uh, you know, just easily computational quantities. So video games are built upon technology of control and quantification. They are still informed by them to some extent. When we produce uh, artful depiction of our world uh, using computers, uh, we inevitably carry over some of that bias, the cybernetic bias that could reinforce certain assumptions and certain mindsets. So this fantasy of control and rationalization of SimCity might makes, uh, make us upset, accept certain uh, ideas, for example, like the idea of uh, smart cities. So this is another, like we're already making uh, sim cities in real life, by the way. Like this is the district, the city of Songdo, uh, the district of Songdo in South Korea. It's the most uh, popular example of smart city. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but I'm gonna just play this promo video. Is ubiquitous city, which is a uniquely Korean concept where every device, component, service is linked to an informational network through wireless computing technology, allowing for greater coordination and a more efficient and synchronized city than has ever been possible before. An example of this is Songdo's trash system, which won't rely on garbage trucks because a network of tubes will suck in the garbage straight from the can and through a system of pipes, transport it efficiently to treatment facilities. So, like, I mean, I'm, I'm totally hip with this idea of like throwing away the, cra the, the garbage into, into tubes and so on. I mean, like, I'm generally fine with efficiency and rationalization, especially uh, like in function of uh, sustainability and uh, environmentalism. Uh, that is also like the premise of socialism, you know, is to move uh, to a less wasteful and more organized way of living, something that unregulated free markets cannot really guarantee. But the issue with Songo with the city is an issue of ownership. So the city is entirely private. And uh, in fact, it's the largest private development in history. They are still building it. And uh, a couple of companies, mostly one company, really owns all the buildings and all the facilities. But the new thing is that they also own the data that you produce so with those all like completely monitored uh, activities. And uh, they basically control the operating system of the city. And uh, yeah, Sondo is being uh, built from scratch for the global elite, uh, possibly anticipating them moving away from the slum slums and the unrest uh, of global warming and uh, global inequality. But yeah, so a uh, uh, SimCity type of utopia is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, so if SimCity abandon every pretense of realism, it will become something like a utopian uh, city building game, right? So what if we think about SimCity that way? I'm kind of intrigued by that possibility. Utopias are uh, useful because uh, they point to a direction uh, they don't need to be like you know re possible really. Uh, they just uh, you know we need we sort of need to dream something before we start to develop it. And utopias are also tools for that. Uh, the problem with uh, most of utopian thinking is the problem with fan fan 
the city I, I was showing before is the idea of tabula rasa, of blank slate. So in order to design a perfect society, according to most of utopian uh, thinking, you have to start from zero. Utopia has a withdrawal from the mess of you know, history of society, pretty much like the city of rapture in, in Bioshock, which is uh, a commentary on uh, utopian and modernist uh, uh, type of thinking, rapture as uh, people like recreating everything from scratch and there is one big designer uh, and uh, obviously it fails because it doesn't take into account the complexity of that. Uh, but I think utopias don't need to or don't have to be complete blueprints uh, to be imposed up down. I think we can ima imagine utopias that are procedural, open-ended uh, and participative. Uh, as I say, this these criticisms of Sin City are not new. Uh, if I were a typical leftist scholar, I would just end here, make a bow and be like, ta-da, this is capitalism and uh, it ruins our lives, you know, after demonstrating that, you know, that the cultural production under capitalism, guess what, tends to exhibit uh, capitalist features uh, like a fractal. But I'm a game maker and I want to provide at least some alternatives and, por and possible starting points for this. Um, so right now I'm making a series of short games that are trying to address some of these issues. Uh, uh, instead of claiming some sort of um, realism that justify the existing uh, understanding of our city, I'm, I'm mostly taking a more like magical realist uh, approach or magical Marxist approach. Uh, so my inspiration, big inspiration, is uh, Italo Calvino's Invisible City. Some of you might have heard of them. It's a collection of short stories describing imaginary, impossible cities. They are city, more like cities as concepts, uh, as states of mind. This is an example. I'm just going to play it super short. If you choose to believe me, good. Now I will tell how Octavia, the spiderweb city, is made. There is a precipice between two steep mountains. The city is over the void, bound to the two crests with ropes and chains and catwalks. You walk on the little wooden ties, careful not to set your foot in the open spaces, or you cling to the hempen strands. Below there is nothing for hundreds and hundreds of feet. A few clouds glide past. Farther down you can glimpse the chasm's bed. This is the foundation of the city, a net which serves as passage and as support. All the rest, instead of rising up, is hung below. Rope ladders, hammocks, houses made like sacks, clothes hangers, terraces like gondolas, skins of water, gas jets, spits, baskets on strings, dumbwaiters, showers, trapezes and rings for children's games, cable cars, chandeliers, pots with trailing plants. Suspended over the abyss, the life of Octavia's inhabitants is less uncertain than in other cities. They know the net will last only so long. Um, and uh, this is a city you can imagine because uh, it's very visual. Other cities are more like uh, abstract and conceptual. This is an uh, uh, even, uh, even shorter one that is about city and memories. When a man rides a long time through wild regions, he feels the desire for a city. Finally, he comes to Isadora, a city where the buildings have spiral staircases encrusted with spiral seashells, where perfect telescopes and violins are made, where the foreigner Hesitating between two women always encounters a third, where cockfights degenerate into bloody brawls among the betters. He was thinking of all these things when he desired a city. Isadora, therefore, is the city of his dreams, with one difference. The dreamed-of city contained him as a young man. He arrives at Isadora in his old age. In the square there is the wall where the old men sit and watch the young go by. He is seated in a row with them. Desires are already memories. Yeah, so ju just to give you an idea, like other ways to conceptualize cities is not just like a bunch of buildings. Right, so this, I just started this project, so I only have a, one example and a half uh, to show. But this is one, novelly, uh, the first of these games that is pretty much done. Uh, it shows this city from the eyes of a real estate uh, uh, speculator, basically, of real estate speculations. It's, it's the void of life that's basically a diagram. This is the kind of private forces that um, I was uh, saying, like, they are not really present in Sin City. They are kind of implied, but not really participating in the development. And I'm just going to play just a brief, a brief video of the gameplay. Super simple. 
goal is basically to make money by uh, buying buildings uh, when they are cheap uh, and resell them when they are uh, when they accrue value. Their size uh, is uh, uh, si uh, representing their value. And uh, after a certain Capital limit, the bubble bursts. Accrued and evaporated over and over. Personal supplies. Reshaping habitats and habits, making Nova Alea unrecognizable to its own residents. Yeah, so it's, it's, there is uh, kind of like a dynamic uh, uh, voiceover, sort of, uh, sort of explaining you what happens, but not really explaining. It's more like um, um, forcing you to think uh, of what you're doing and uh, bringing you, uh, basically creating a little bit of critical distance uh, and uh, breaking down the automatism that you sometimes play when you have when you're playing abstract games. That you're like, okay, I'm just gonna maximize this, and uh, the voice is sort of like serves the purpose of. Uh, uh, encouraging you to reconnect this experience to what you like, what you really know or think about about cities. So it's a simple mechanic, but that's basically the logic of that is transforming cities today. Kind of house flipping and speculation that is really driving people uh, away. Uh, so Maybe cities result from conflicts. I'm just gonna shut, shut it off. Uh, city are uh, res result from conflicts, and conflicts are not always uh, solvable. There's not always a, a way to make everybody be like happy and agreeing. Uh, and in Novalea, you you're facing the resistance from from below. You're facing some uh, some of pushback of that. Uh, citizens will try to impose uh, rent control measures, uh, so limiting your ability to speculate, and uh, they'll try to create public housing. So like. Uh, taking away some of these buildings from uh, from uh, the landscape, uh, and uh, they will try to introduce anti-speculation measures that are sort of modeled uh, uh, after uh, some of the actual proposals that are being, uh, uh, you know, proposed in uh, places like uh, uh, San Francisco, for example. So the game will have different outcomes based on uh, who gets the upper hand in this uh, asymmetrical conflict. Um, City so don't always grow, so this uh, uh, kind of like primacy of growth, of endless growth, uh, uh, it's, it's to me is a bit, bit of a problem and, a, and an interesting uh, thing to kind of break uh, and, uh, and poke at. So uh, this is a prototype of Motoria, which is the second game, uh, and uh, it's inspired by Detroit. I don't know if you know about Detroit. You, you might know that it used to be a major industrial center. That's where they built all the cars uh, in the United States. And when the auto industry moved the factories away or closed the factories because, because of competition from uh, East Asia, uh, it rapidly lost population, had a major impact. Detroit was pretty much betting everything on the auto industry. And uh, so when that left, uh, it, it was like a major disaster. And uh, uh, it rapidly lost populations and uh, many buildings were abandoned and demolished. So right now Detroit like feels pretty much empty because it's still a big sprawling as it used to be. Uh, and uh, so the city is, the city government is basically trying to, uh, having a uh, having hard time providing services and maintenance uh, to this like very spread and, de and, and uh, unpopulated city. So they are basically coming up with a downsizing plan. The idea is to shrink Detroit to make it more uh, manageable and more compact, uh, and which is a kind of interesting idea, but it's also quite contentious because obviously who gets to stay, who gets to move, uh, uh, where and when, uh, it, it's, it's bound to create a lot of conflict. And uh, this is a game basically inspired by that. By that, you, you instead of expanding your city, you're trying to shrink it and uh, to minimize uh, relocations and uh, negotiate between. Uh, the desires of different citizens that might, you know, push back and be like, I don't want to live next to the, this factory, I don't want to live next to poor people, and so on. So that's Montoria. So in conclusion, I've been trying to, for years to imagine an alternative Sin City. This is a, a project that has been long in, into making, and be like, I'm going to make the anti Sin City, I'm going to show with right that I'm better. And uh, I realized that the biggest uh, fallacy of, of a city simulator is to try to present itself as an all-encompassing system. So th this idea that you're supposedly ca capable of describing many possible cities with one algorithm is just a little bit too much from what humans can do <laughs> these days. And so I believe that in order to move from the SimCity paradigm, uh, we need uh, many different city simulators, basically. Uh, each, one that, each one has to limit its scope to certain dynamics and certain contexts. Uh, each one uh, should declare its own uh, intent, uh, in its own uh, embedded values. Uh, so what we should make uh, is not games that explain how cities, especially old city w cities work, uh, but rather games that we can use to think about our cities, uh, past, uh, present, and future. 
So that's that's all I have to say for today. Thank you very much, and uh, <laughs> sorry for the super heavy and dense uh, talk. Yeah. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? I mean, uh, I just, um, do you know any other initiatives uh, trying to do, how would I call it, more realistic simulation? No, don't use that word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, trying to get away from this bias. I, I, th I think so. I think, uh, you know, I haven't got too much deep into that, but I think city skylines with the fact that it's based on modding is already a huge step forward because at least, you know, you can uh, try things out. I think there are still some assumptions that are there and uh, mainly the idea that, okay, even if you're, if you're giving away some source code or some ability to mod, then uh, you can expand it and maybe together we can make the ultimate realistic city. I still think there are, uh, it's, it's, it's not really, it's, uh, yeah, it's not really the case. Um, I think there are some, uh, I've seen some other uh, different approaches to uh, CD games, uh, or like some of them might be more like CD themed uh, games, uh, so it's a more maybe like more like a puzzle, and uh, these games are kind of like more like a puzzle, but I'm fine with that, like uh, I think puzzles can uh, can speak about things, uh, can talk about things. So I'm, uh, I will be like really happy to like if this uh, ideas or like this uh, this idea was more than you know my personal project. Uh, maybe like it can be a you know a subgenre of reimagining uh, how city simulation work beyond Sin City. And the other question I had is, uh, did you also think with this process maybe not only look because I think Sin City is not only about urban but also about population management. And that, for example, is something you, you didn't talk about, but I don't know if it's because it's not your personal interest. Uh, what do you mean by population ma management? Well, having jobs or unemployment or homeless people or right, right, right. this kind of thing. That is not really urban management, but really population management. Like, how do you make to ha everybody having a job and a salary and this kind of mm -hmm. thing, which is part of SimCity and also very biased. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. There is this this idea that uh, buildings are kind of protagonists and uh, um, people are sort of like uh, a function of these buildings, uh, which is interesting. And I'm not addressing in this uh, in this uh, two examples, and uh, probably not even in the third, which will be still kind of assuming that. Uh, that's why, like, I think it's kind of important to like uh, make little things that are maybe like uh, poking a different uh, a different aspects. Yeah, because uh, because uh, will be it's hard. Like either you make a population control type of management, or uh, yeah, it's it's just too much to take, uh, and it's not just a, a matter of budget. So you know. Yes. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how much Dwarf Fortress, with its approach, is maybe kind of different, different take on this thing because. Um, it, like in comparison to like stuff like SimCity, you are not really building. I mean, you are building a city in Dwarf Fortress, but it's underground in some way, and it's also kind of based on the history of the world. Like it, it Dwarf Fortress simulates a whole history of the world, and I think also geological history and, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. it's not really a tabula rasa like in in, in SimCity and how this compares, because um, I think you you kind of touch on the, like same aspects as the to talk before. In terms of like a historical uh, aspect, a city isn't a historical. You're not, you're not going to a plain land and just. Uh, right, but it did happen. You know, a few times. You know, in a few examples that were probably the examples that uh, Will Wright had had in his mind that happened. Yeah. The interesting aspect of uh, of this, however, is that oftentimes those cities are oftentimes perceived as very sterile from the people who are mostly not living in those cities, but in, in general in the public public perception of this. So uh, I was just wondering how much like simulating a, a history of a place is also important in this, in this regard, because history and the perception of the people of historical importance of spaces 
it's also important on perception of the city and simulation of the space, I think. Yeah, I have some ideas that will be kind of like the next phase of like, okay, so how a city exists in space, but also in time. So how do you kind of like render that in a video game? And I think in that case, I will probably have to completely like uh, uh, move away from the planning top-down thing. So like the, um, I, I have a, a couple of other ideas uh, regarding uh, city games that you are playing uh, from a street level. Like right now, obviously there are um, pretty interesting and dynamic uh, representations of cities in games like uh, GTA thing. Like that's that's really a, like an interesting, vital type of city. Uh, you have class stratification, you have uh, different buildings and neighbors, uh, you know, and the fluxes and so on. So it's pretty cool. Uh, but um, uh, the city is always kind of like historically static. It's, uh, it's always a backdrop. How can you make a game in which you are in a city, but the city itself is a is the main character really like that evolves that have uh, some kind of behavior and, uh, and it's not always about you the player right so. yes somebody from far away mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying that like the with the voice sort of like commenting is not really explaining what what happens. It's not a tutorial, but it's more of a, a kind of like an oblique view on what you're doing. Uh, kind of qualifies the mechanics, and uh, I think there are different tricks. And I've been uh, you know I've been kind of like doing that in uh, with other games and other gameplays uh, pretty consistently in like uh, with with my games. To me, the idea is to create a bit of a critical distance, right? Which is kind of totally opposite to what uh, the mainstream. Uh, paradigm of game design and development is like uh, ideally in a, in a game you want people to be like totally immersed totally lost and which is amazing I mean obviously as a player I understand that that pleasure but it, to me it's even more interesting when the game sort of occasionally pushes you out of this uh, immersion and disbelief you know you just have to po to poke uh, to poke your player and be like hey don't get too much uh, too much uh, into this abstract thinking, like what you're doing has some relationship with your the world around you, and uh, like think about what your what what your clicks uh, are basically. Yeah. Sorry, what? Uh, last Uh, oh yeah, I mean, to me they are related, like if you're telling the player, oh look at what you're doing, and there are a lot of games now that are doing it in terms of like old violence, I give you like a violent shooter and then uh, since uh, it's 2016 uh, I'm, and I'm super embarrassed of reproducing this like stupid violent shooter, maybe I add a little narrative element that tells you, hey but you're a bad guy. <laughs> like, like, come on, like, don't shoot that much, and then you, so, like, there is, there is that, like, fairly simplistic way to produce some critical distance, uh, I don't think is always, uh, always works, uh, especially when uh, the act of playing is actually very pleasurable, but to me, like, the agency, like, the player sort of actions and uh, the designer actions is, it's basically a dialogue, so they are, like, kind of in interrelated in that sense. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how we are doing with time. So. Okay. Thank you. So now there's exactly 15 minutes of a break. So if you want to grab a coffee, be fast, because in 15 minutes we will have the live play of Beginner's Guide in here. No, it's here. Yeah. <laughs>